Chapter 25 If Pinocchio cried much longer, the little woman thought he would melt away, so she finally admitted that she was the little fairy with azure hair. "'You rascal of a marionette! How did you know it was I?' she asked, laughing. "'My love for you told me who you were.' "'Do you remember? You left me when I was a little girl, and now you find me a grown woman. I am so old I could almost be your mother.' I am very glad of that, for then I can call you mother instead of sister. For a long time I have wanted a mother, just like other boys. But how did you grow so quickly? That's a secret. Tell it to me. I also want to grow a little. Look at me. I have never grown higher than a penny's worth of cheese. But you can't grow, answered the fairy. Why not? Because marionettes never grow. They are born marionettes, they live marionettes, and they die marionettes. "'Oh, I'm tired of always being a marionette!' cried Pinocchio disgustedly. "'It's about time for me to grow into a man as everyone else does.' "'And you will if you deserve it.' "'Really? What can I do to deserve it?' "'It's a very simple matter. Try to act like a well-behaved child.' "'Don't you think I do?' Far from it. Good boys are obedient, and you, on the contrary, and I never obey. Good boys love study and work, but you, and I, on the contrary, am a lazy fellow and a tramp all year round. Good boys always tell the truth, and I always tell lies. Good boys go gladly to school, and I get sick if I go to school. From now on, I'll be different. Do you promise? I promise. I want to become a good boy and be a comfort to my father. Where is my poor father now? I do not know. Will I ever be lucky enough to find him and embrace him once more? I think so. Indeed, I am sure of it. At this answer, Pinocchio's happiness was very great. He grasped the fairy's hands and kissed them so hard that it looked as if he had lost his head. Then, lifting his face, he looked at her lovingly and asked, "'Tell me, little mother, it isn't true that you are dead, is it?' "'It doesn't seem so,' answered the fairy, smiling. "'If you only knew how I suffered and how I wept when I read, Here lies, I know it. And for that I have forgiven you. The depth of your sorrow made me see that you have a kind heart. There is always hope for boys with hearts such as yours, though they may often be mischievous. This is the reason why I have come so far to look for you. From now on I'll be your own little mother." "'Oh, how lovely!' cried Pinocchio, jumping with joy. You will obey me always and do as I wish? Gladly, very gladly, more than gladly. Beginning tomorrow, said the fairy, you'll go to school every day. Pinocchio's face fell a little. Then you will choose the trade you like best. Pinocchio became more serious. What are you mumbling to yourself? asked the fairy. I was just saying, whined the marionette in a whisper, that it seems too late for me to go to school now. No, indeed. Remember it is never too late to learn. But I don't want either trade or profession. Why? Because work wearies me. My dear boy, said the fairy, people who speak as you do usually end their days either in a prison or in a hospital. A man, remember, whether rich or poor, should do something in this world. No one can find happiness without work. Woe betide the lazy fellow! Laziness is a serious illness, and one must cure it immediately, yes, even from early childhood. If not, it will kill you in the end." These words touched Pinocchio's heart. He lifted his eyes to his fairy and said seriously, I'll work, I'll study, 
I'll do all you tell me. After all, the life of a marionette has grown very tiresome to me, and I want to become a boy, no matter how hard it is. You promise that, do you not? Yes, I promise. And now it is up to you. Chapter 26 In the morning, bright and early, Pinocchio started for school. Imagine what the boys said when they saw a marionette enter the classroom. They laughed until they cried. Everyone played tricks on him. One pulled his hat off, another tugged at his coat, a third tried to paint a mustache under his nose. One even attempted to tie strings to his feet and his hands to make him dance. For a while Pinocchio was very calm and quiet. Finally, however, he lost all patience, and, turning to his tormentors, he said to them threateningly, "'Careful, boys! I haven't come here to be made fun of. I'll respect you, and I want you to respect me.' "'Hurrah for Dr. Knowall! You have spoken like a printed book!' <laughs> howled the boys, bursting with laughter. One of them, more impudent than the rest, put out his hand to pull the marionette's nose. But he was not quick enough, for Pinocchio stretched his leg under the table and kicked him hard on the shin. "'Oh, what hard feet!' cried the boy, rubbing the spot where the marionette had kicked him. "'And what elbows! They're even harder than the feet!' shouted another one, who— because of some other trick, had received a blow in the stomach. With that kick and that blow Pinocchio gained everybody's favor. Everyone admired him, danced attendance upon him, petted and caressed him. As the days passed into weeks, even the teacher praised him, for he saw him attentive, hard-working, and wide awake, always the first to come in the morning, and the last to leave when school was over. Pinocchio's only fault was that he had too many friends. Among these were many well-known rascals, who cared not a jot for study or for success. The teacher warned him each day, and even the good fairy repeated to him many times, "'Take care, Pinocchio. Those bad companions will sooner or later make you lose your love for study. Some day they will lead you astray.' "'There's no such danger.' answered the marionette, shrugging his shoulders and pointing to his forehead, as if to say, I'm too wise. So it happened that one day, as he was walking to school, he met some boys who ran up to him and said, Have you heard the news? No. A shark as big as a mountain has been seen near the shore. Really? I wonder if it could be the same one I heard of when my father was drowned. We are going to see it. Are you coming? No, not I. I must go to school. What do you care about school? You can go there tomorrow. With a lesson more or less, we are always the same donkeys. And what will the teacher say? Let him talk. He is paid to grumble all day long. And my mother? Mothers don't know anything, answered those scamps. Do you know what I'll do? said Pinocchio. For certain reasons of mine, I, too, want to see that shark. But I'll go after school. I can see him then as well as now. "'Poor simpleton!' cried one of the boys. "'Do you think that a fish of that size will stand there waiting for you? He turns and off he goes, and no one will ever be the wiser.' "'How long does it take from here to the shore?' asked the marionette. "'One hour there and back.' "'Very well, then. Let's see who gets there first. cried Pinocchio. At the signal, the little troop, with books under their arms, dashed across the fields. Pinocchio led the way, running as if on wings, the others following as fast as they could. Now and again he looked back, and, seeing his followers hot and tired, and with tongues hanging out, he laughed out heartily. "'Unhappy boy!' If he had only known then the dreadful things that were to happen to him on account of his disobedience. Chapter 27 Going like the wind, Pinocchio took but a very short time to reach the shore. He glanced all about him, but there was no sign of a shark. The sea was as smooth as glass. 
"'Hey there, boys! Where's that shark?' he asked, turning to his playmates. "'He may have gone for his breakfast,' said one of them, laughing. "'Or perhaps he went to bed for a little nap,' said another, laughing also. From the answers and the laughter which followed them, Pinocchio understood that the boys had played a trick on him. "'What now?' he said angrily to them. "'What's the joke?' "'Oh, the joke's on you!' cried his tormentors, laughing more heartily than ever, and dancing gaily around the marionette. "'And that is—' "'That we have made you stay out of school to come with us. Aren't you ashamed of being such a goody-goody and studying so hard? You never have a bit of enjoyment.' "'And what is it to you, if I do study?' "'What does the teacher think of us, you mean?' "'Why?' Don't you see? If you study, and we don't, we pay for it. After all, it's only fair to look out for ourselves. What do you want me to do? Hate school and books and teachers as we all do. They are your worst enemies, you know, and they like to make you as unhappy as they can. And if I go on studying, what will you do to me? You'll pay for it. "'Really, you amuse me,' answered the marionette, nodding his head. "'Hey, Pinocchio!' cried the tallest of them all. "'That will do. We are tired of hearing you bragging about yourself, you little turkey-cock. You may not be afraid of us, but remember we are not afraid of you, either. You are alone, you know, and we are seven. "'Like the seven sins,' said Pinocchio, still laughing. "'Did you hear that? He has insulted us all. He has called us sins. "'Pinocchio, apologize for that, or look out.' "'Cuckoo!' said the marionette, mocking them with his thumb to his nose. "'You'll be sorry.' "'Cuckoo!' "'We'll whip you soundly.' "'Cuckoo!' "'You'll go home with a broken nose.' "'Cuckoo!' "'Very well, then. Take that, and keep it for your supper.' cried out the boldest of his tormentors, and with the words he gave Pinocchio a terrible blow on the head. Pinocchio answered with another blow, and that was the signal for the beginning of the fray. In a few moments the fight raged hot and heavy on both sides. Pinocchio, although alone, defended himself bravely. With those two wooden feet of his, he worked so fast that his opponents kept at a respectful distance. Wherever they landed, they left their painful mark, and the boys could only run away and howl. Enraged at not being able to fight the marionette at close quarters, they started to throw all kinds of books at him. Readers, geographies, histories, grammars flew in all directions. But Pinocchio was keen of eye and swift of movement, and the books only passed over his head, landed in the sea, and disappeared. The fish, thinking they might be good to eat, came to the top of the water in great numbers. Some took a nibble, some took a bite, but no sooner had they tasted a page or two than they spat them out with a wry face, as if to say, What a horrid taste! Our own food is so much better! Meanwhile, the battle waxed more and more furious. At the noise, a large crab crawled slowly out of the water, and with a voice that sounded like a trombone suffering from a cold, he cried out, "'Stop fighting, you rascals! These battles between boys rarely end well. Trouble is sure to come to you!' Poor Crab! He might as well have spoken to the wind. Instead of listening to his good advice, Pinocchio turned to him, and said as roughly as he knew how, "'Keep quiet, ugly gab! It would be better for you to chew a few cough drops to get rid of that cold you have. Go to bed and sleep!' You will feel better in the morning. In the meantime, the boys, having used all their books, looked around for new ammunition. Seeing Pinocchio's bundle lying idle nearby, they somehow managed to get hold of it. One of the books was a very large volume, an arithmetic text, heavily bound in leather. It was Pinocchio's pride. Among all his books he liked that one the best. Thinking it would make a fine missile, one of the boys took hold of it, 
and threw it with all his strength at Pinocchio's head. But instead of hitting the marionette, the book struck one of the other boys, who, as pale as a ghost, cried out faintly, "'Oh, mother, help! I'm dying!' and fell senseless to the ground. At the sight of that pale little corpse, the boys were so frightened that they turned tail and ran. In a few moments all had disappeared. All except Pinocchio. Although scared to death by the horror of what had been done, he ran to the sea and soaked his handkerchief in the cool water, and with it bathed the head of his poor little schoolmate. Sobbing bitterly, he called to him, saying, "'Eugene! My poor Eugene! Open your eyes and look at me! Why don't you answer? I was not the one who hit you, you know. Believe me, I didn't do it. Open your eyes, Eugene. If you keep them shut, I'll die, too. Oh, dear me! How shall I ever go home now? How shall I ever look at my little mother again? What will happen to me? Where shall I go? Where shall I hide? Oh, how much better it would have been! A thousand times better! If only I had gone to school! Why did I listen to those boys? They always were a bad influence. And to think that the teacher had told me, and my mother, too, beware of bad company. That's what she said. But I'm stubborn and proud. I listen, but always I do as I wish. And then I pay. I've never had a moment's peace since I've been born. Oh, dear, what will become of me? What will become of me? Pinocchio went on crying and moaning and beating his head. Again and again he called to his little friend, when suddenly he heard heavy steps approaching. He looked up and saw two tall carabineers near him. "'What are you doing stretched out on the ground?' they asked Pinocchio. "'I'm helping this schoolfellow of mine.' "'Has he fainted?' "'I should say so.' said one of the carabineers, bending to look at Eugene. "'This boy has been wounded on the temple. Who has hurt him?' "'Not I,' stammered the marionette, who had hardly a breath left in his whole body. "'If it wasn't you, who was it then?' "'Not I,' repeated Pinocchio. "'And with what was he wounded?' "'With this book?' And the marionette picked up the arithmetic text to show it to the officer. And whose book is this? Mine. Enough. Not another word. Get up as quickly as you can and come along with us. But I... Come with us. Before starting out, the officers called out to several fishermen passing by in a boat, and said to them, Take care of this little fellow who has been hurt. Take him home and bind his wounds. Tomorrow we'll come after him. They then took hold of Pinocchio, and putting him between them, said to him in a rough voice, March, and go quickly, or it will be the worse for you. They did not have to repeat their words. The marionette walked swiftly along the road to the village. But the poor fellow hardly knew what he was about. He thought he had a nightmare. He felt ill. His eyes saw everything double. His legs trembled. His tongue was dry and, try as he might, he could not utter a single word. Yet in spite of this numbness of feeling, he suffered keenly at the thought of passing under the windows of his good little fairy's house. What would she say on seeing him between two carabineers? They had just reached the village, when a sudden gust of wind blew off Pinocchio's cap and made it go sailing far down the street. "'Would you allow me?' the marionette asked the carabineers to run after my cap? Very well, go, but hurry. The marionette went, picked up his cap, but instead of putting it on his head, he stuck it between his teeth and then raced toward the sea. He went like a bullet out of a gun. The carabineers, judging that it would be very difficult to catch him, sent a large mastiff after him, one that had won first prize in all the dog races. Pinocchio ran fast, and the dog ran faster. At so much noise, the people hung out of the windows or gathered in the street, anxious to see the end of the contest. But they were disappointed, 
for the dog and Pinocchio raised so much dust on the road that, after a few moments, it was impossible to see them. Chapter 28 During that wild chase, Pinocchio lived through a terrible moment when he almost gave himself up as lost. This was when Alidoro, that was the Mastiff's name, in a frenzy of running, came so near that he was on the very point of reaching him. The marionette heard, close behind him, the laboured breathing of the beast who was fast on his trail, and now and again even felt his hot breath blow over him. Luckily, by this time he was very near the shore, and the sea was in sight, in fact, only a few short steps away. As soon as he set foot on the beach, Pinocchio gave a leap and fell into the water. Alidoro tried to stop, but as he was running very fast, he couldn't, and he too landed far out in the sea. Strange though it may seem, the dog could not swim. He beat the water with his paws to hold himself up, but the harder he tried, the deeper he sank. As he stuck his head out once more, the poor fellow's eyes were bulging, and he barked out wildly, I drown! I drown! Drown! answered Pinocchio from afar, happy at his escape. Help, Pinocchio! Dear little Pinocchio! Save me from death! At those cries of suffering, the marionette, who, after all, had a very kind heart, was moved to compassion. He turned toward the poor animal and said to him, But if I help you, will you promise not to bother me again by running after me? I promise! I promise! Only hurry! For if you wait another second, I'll be dead and gone!" Pinocchio hesitated still another minute. Then, remembering how his father had often told him that a kind deed is never lost, he swam to Alidoro, and, catching hold of his tail, dragged him to the shore. The poor dog was so weak he could not stand. He had swallowed so much salt water that he was swollen like a balloon. However, Pinocchio, not wishing to trust him too much, threw himself once again into the sea. As he swam away, he called out, "'Good-bye, Alidoro. Good luck, and remember me to the family.' "'Good-bye, little Pinocchio,' answered the dog. "'A thousand thanks for having saved me from death. You did me a good turn, and in this world what is given is always returned.' If the chance comes, I shall be there." Pinocchio went on swimming close to shore. At last he thought he had reached a safe place. Glancing up and down the beach, he saw the opening of a cave out of which rose a spiral of smoke. "'In that cave,' he said to himself, "'there must be a fire. So much the better. I'll dry my clothes and warm myself, and then, well, his mind made up, Pinocchio swam to the rocks, but as he started to climb, he felt something under him lifting him up higher and higher. He tried to escape, but he was too late. To his great surprise, he found himself in a huge net, amid a crowd of fish of all kinds and sizes, who were fighting and struggling desperately to free themselves. At the same time he saw a fisherman come out of the cave a fisherman so ugly that Pinocchio thought he was a sea-monster. In place of hair, his head was covered by a thick bush of green grass. Green was the skin of his body, green were his eyes, green was the long, long beard that reached down to his feet. He looked like a giant lizard with legs and arms. When the fisherman pulled the net out of the sea, he cried out joyfully, Blessed Providence! Once more I'll have a fine meal of fish!" "'Thank heaven I'm not a fish!' said Pinocchio to himself, trying with these words to find a little courage. The fisherman took the net and the fish to the cave, a dark, gloomy, smoky place. In the middle of it, a pan full of oil sizzled over a smoky fire sending out a repelling odour of tallow that took away one's breath. "'Now let us see what kind of fish we have caught to-day,' said the green fisherman. 
he put a hand as big as a spade into the net, and pulled out a handful of mullets. "'Fine mullets, these!' he said, after looking at them, and smelling them with pleasure. After that he threw them into a large empty tub. Many times he repeated this performance. As he pulled each fish out of the net, his mouth watered with the thought of the good dinner coming, and he said, "'Fine fish, these bass! Very tasty, these white fish! Delicious flounders, these! What splendid crabs! And these dear little anchovies, with their heads still on!' As you can well imagine, the bass, the flounders, the whitefish, and even the little anchovies all went together into the tub to keep the mullets company. The last to come out of the net was Pinocchio. As soon as the fisherman pulled him out, his green eyes opened wide with surprise, and he cried out in fear, "'What kind of fish is this? I don't remember ever eating anything like it.' He looked at him closely and after turning him over and over, he said at last, "'I understand. He must be a crab.' Pinocchio, mortified at being taken for a crab, said resentfully, "'What nonsense! A crab, indeed! I am no such thing! Beware how you deal with me! I am a marionette, I want you to know.' "'A marionette?' asked the fisherman. I must admit that a marionette fish is, for me, an entirely new kind of fish. So much the better. I'll eat you with greater relish. Eat me? But can't you understand that I'm not a fish? Can't you hear that I speak and think as you do? It's true, answered the fisherman. But since I see that you are a fish, well able to talk and think as I do, I'll treat you with all due respect. And that is? That, as a sign of my particular esteem, I'll leave to you the choice of the manner in which you are to be cooked. Do you wish to be fried in a pan, or do you prefer to be cooked with tomato sauce? To tell you the truth, answered Pinocchio, if I must choose, I should much rather go free, so I may return home. Are you fooling? Do you think that I want to lose the opportunity to taste such a rare fish? A marionette fish does not come very often to these seas. Leave it to me. I'll fry you in the pan with the others. I know you'll like it. It's always a comfort to find oneself in good company. The unlucky marionette, hearing this, began to cry and wail and beg. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he said, how much better it would have been for me to go to school! I did listen to my playmates, and now I am paying for it! Oh, oh, oh!" And as he struggled and squirmed like an eel to escape from him, the green fisherman took a stout cord and tied him hand and foot, and threw him into the bottom of the tub with the others. Then he pulled a wooden bowl full of flour out of a cupboard and started to roll the fish into it one by one. When they were white with it, he threw them into the pan. The first to dance in the hot oil were the mullets. The bass followed, then the whitefish, the flounders, and the anchovies. Pinocchio's turn came last. Seeing himself so near to death, and such a horrible death, he began to tremble so with fright that he had no voice left with which to beg for his life. The poor boy beseeched only with his eyes. But the green fisherman, not even noticing that it was he, turned him over and over in the flower until he looked like a marionette made of chalk. Then he took him by the head and— Chapter 29 Mindful of what the fisherman had said, Pinocchio knew that all hope of being saved had gone. He closed his eyes and waited for the final moment. Suddenly, a large dog, attracted by the odor of the boiling oil, came running into the cave. "'Get out!' cried the fisherman threateningly, and still holding on to the marionette, who was all covered with flour. But the poor dog was very hungry, and whining and wagging his tail he tried to say, "'Give me a bite of the fish, and I'll go in peace!' "'Get out, I say!' repeated the fisherman. 
and he drew back his foot to give the dog a kick. Then the dog, who, being really hungry, would take no refusal, turned in a rage toward the fisherman and bared his terrible fangs. And at that moment a pitiful little voice was heard saying, "'Save me, Alidoro! If you don't, I fry!' The dog immediately recognized Pinocchio's voice. Great was his surprise to find that the voice came from the little flower-covered bundle that the fisherman held in his hand. Then what did he do? With one great leap he grasped that bundle in his mouth, and, holding it lightly between his teeth, ran through the door and disappeared like a flash. The fisherman, angry at seeing his meal snatched from under his nose, ran after the dog, but a bad fit of coughing made him stop and turn back. Meanwhile, Alidoro, as soon as he had found the road which led to the village, stopped and dropped Pinocchio softly to the ground. "'How much I do thank you!' said the marionette. "'It is not necessary!' answered the dog. "'You save me once, and what is given is always returned. We are in this world to help one another.' "'But how did you get in that cave?' I was lying here, on the sand, more dead than alive, when an appetizing odor of fried fish came to me. That odor tickled my hunger, and I followed it. Oh, if I had come a moment later! Don't speak about it, wailed Pinocchio, still trembling with fright. Don't say a word. If you had come a moment later, I would be fried, eaten, and digested by this time. Brrr! I shiver at the mere thought of it." Alidoro laughingly held out his paw to the marionette, who shook it heartily, feeling that now he and the dog were good friends. Then they bid each other good-bye, and the dog went home. Pinocchio, left alone, walked toward a little hut nearby, where an old man sat at the door, sunning himself, and asked, "'Tell me, good man, have you heard anything of a poor boy with a wounded head? whose name was Eugene?" "'The boy was brought to this hut, and now—' "'Now he is dead?' Pinocchio interrupted sorrowfully. "'No, he is now alive, and he is already returned home.' "'Really? Really?' cried the marionette, jumping around with joy. "'Then the wound was not serious?' "'But it might have been, and even mortal.' answered the old man, for a heavy book was thrown at his head. And who threw it? A schoolmate of his, a certain Pinocchio. And who is this Pinocchio? asked the marionette, feigning ignorance. They say he is a mischief-maker, a tramp, a street urchin. Calumnies, all calumnies. Do you know this Pinocchio? by sight," answered the marionette. "'And what do you think of him?' asked the old man. "'I think he's a very good boy, fond of study, obedient, kind to his father and to his whole family.' As he was telling all these enormous lies about himself, Pinocchio touched his nose and found it twice as long as it should be. Scared out of his wits, he cried out, "'Don't listen to me, good man!' All the wonderful things I have said are not true at all. I know Pinocchio well, and he is indeed a very wicked fellow, lazy and disobedient, who, instead of going to school, runs away with his playmates to have a good time." At this speech his nose returned to its natural size. "'Why are you so pale?' the old man asked suddenly. "'Let me tell you, without knowing it, I rubbed myself against a newly painted wall," he lied, ashamed to say that he had been made ready for the frying-pan. "'What have you done with your coat and your hat and your breeches?' "'I met thieves, and they robbed me. Tell me, my good man, have you not perhaps a little suit to give me, so that I may go home?' "'My boy, as for clothes, I have only a bag in which I keep hops. If you want it, take it, there it is." Pinocchio did not wait for him to repeat his words. He took the bag, which happened to be empty, and after cutting a big hole at the top, 
and two at the sides, he slipped into it as if it were a shirt. Lightly clad as he was, he started out toward the village. Along the way he felt very uneasy. In fact, he was so unhappy that he went along taking two steps forward and one back, and as he went he said to himself, "'How shall I ever face my good little fairy? What will she say when she sees me? Will she forgive this last trick of mine? I am sure she won't. Oh, no, she won't. And I deserve it as usual, for I am a rascal, fine on promises which I never keep.' He came to the village late at night. It was so dark he could see nothing, and it was raining pitchforks. Pinocchio ran straight to the fairy's house, firmly resolved to knock at the door. When he found himself there he lost courage, and ran back a few steps. A second time he came to the door, and again he ran back. A third time he repeated his performance. The fourth time, before he had time to lose his courage, he grasped the knocker and made a faint sound with it. He waited, and waited, and waited. Finally, after a full half-hour, a top-floor window, the house had four stories, opened, and Pinocchio saw a large snail look out. A tiny light glowed on top of her head. "'Who knocks at this late hour?' she called. "'Is the fairy home?' asked the marionette. The fairy is asleep and does not wish to be disturbed. Who are you? It is I. Who's I? Pinocchio. Who is Pinocchio? The marionette, the one who lives in the fairy's house. Oh, I understand, said the snail. Wait for me there. I'll come down to open the door for you. Hurry, I beg of you, for I am dying of cold. My boy, I am a snail, and snails are never in a hurry. An hour passed, two hours, and the door was still closed. Pinocchio, who was trembling with fear and shivering from the cold rain on his back, knocked a second time, this time louder than before. At that second knock a window on the third floor opened, and the same snail looked out. "'Dear little snail!' cried Pinocchio from the street. I have been waiting two hours for you, and two hours on a dreadful night like this are as long as two years. Hurry, please. My boy, answered the snail in a calm, peaceful voice, my dear boy, I am a snail, and snails are never in a hurry. And the window closed. A few minutes later midnight struck, then one o'clock, two o'clock, and the door still remained closed. Then Pinocchio, losing all patience, grabbed the knocker with both hands, fully determined to awaken the whole house and street with it. As soon as he touched the knocker, however, it became an eel, and wiggled away into the darkness. "'Really?' cried Pinocchio, blind with rage. "'If the knocker is gone, I can still use my feet.' He stepped back and gave the door a most solemn kick. He kicked so hard that his foot went straight through the door, and his leg followed almost to the knee. No matter how he pulled and tugged, he could not pull it out. There he stayed as if nailed to the door. Poor Pinocchio! The rest of the night he had to spend with one foot through the door and the other one in the air. As dawn was breaking, the door finally opened. That brave little animal, the snail, had taken exactly nine hours to go from the fourth floor to the street. How she must have raced! "'What are you doing with your foot through the door?' she asked the marionette, laughing. "'It was a misfortune. Won't you try, pretty little snail, to free me from this terrible torture?' "'My boy, we need a carpenter here.' and I have never been one. Ask the fairy to help me. The fairy is asleep, and does not want to be disturbed. But what do you want me to do, nailed to the door like this? Enjoy yourself counting the ants which are passing by. 
bring me something to eat, at least, for I am faint with hunger. Immediately. In fact, after three hours and a half, Pinocchio saw her return with a silver tray on her head. On the tray there was bread, roast chicken, fruit. Here is the breakfast the fairy sends to you, said the snail. At the sight of all these good things the marionette felt much better. What was his disgust, however, when on tasting the food he found the bread to be made of chalk, the chicken of cardboard, and the brilliant fruit of colored alabaster? He wanted to cry. He wanted to give himself up to despair. He wanted to throw away the tray and all that was on it. Instead, either from pain or weakness, he fell to the floor in a dead faint. When he regained his senses, he found himself stretched out on a sofa, and the fairy was seated near him. "'This time also I forgive you,' said the fairy to him. "'But be careful not to get into mischief again.' Pinocchio promised to study and to behave himself, and he kept his word for the remainder of the year. At the end of it he passed first in all his examinations, and his report was so good that the fairy said to him happily, "'To-morrow your wish will come true.' "'And what is it?' "'To-morrow you will cease to be a marionette, and will become a real boy.' Pinocchio was beside himself with joy. All his friends and schoolmates must be invited to celebrate the great event. The fairy promised to prepare two hundred cups of coffee and milk, and four hundred slices of toast buttered on both sides. The day promised to be a very gay and happy one. But, unluckily, in a marionette's life there is always a but, which is apt to spoil everything. CHAPTER Thirty. Coming at last out of the surprise into which the fairy's word had thrown him, Pinocchio asked for permission to give out the invitations. "'Indeed, you may invite your friends to tomorrow's party. Only remember to return home before dark. Do you understand?' "'I'll be back in one hour without fail,' answered the marionette. "'Take care, Pinocchio. Boys give promises very easily.' but they as easily forget them. But I am not like those others. When I give my word, I keep it. We shall see. In case you do disobey, you will be the one to suffer, not any one else. Why? Because boys who do not listen to their elders always come to grief. I certainly have, said Pinocchio, but from now on I obey. We shall see if you are telling the truth. Without adding another word, the marionette bade the good fairy good-bye, and singing and dancing, he left the house. In a little more than an hour, all his friends were invited. Some accepted quickly and gladly. Others had to be coaxed, but when they heard that the toast was to be buttered on both sides, they all ended by accepting the invitation with the words, "'We'll come to please you!' Now it must be known that, among all his friends, Pinocchio had one whom he loved most of all. The boy's real name was Romeo, but everyone called him Lampwick, for he was long and thin and had a woebegone look about him. Lampwick was the laziest boy in the school and the biggest mischief-maker, but Pinocchio loved him dearly. That day he went straight to his friend's house to invite him to the party, but Lampwick was not at home. He went a second time, and again a third, but still without success. Where could he be? Pinocchio searched here and there and everywhere, and finally discovered him hiding near a farmer's wagon. "'What are you doing there?' asked Pinocchio, running up to him. "'I am waiting for midnight to strike to go—' "'Where?' "'Far, far away.' and I have gone to your house three times to look for you. What did you want from me? Haven't you heard the news? Don't you know what good luck is mine? What is it? Tomorrow I end my days as a marionette and become a boy, 
like you and all my other friends. May it bring you luck. Shall I see you at my party tomorrow? But I'm telling you that I go tonight. At what time? At midnight. And where are you going? To a real country, the best in the world, a wonderful place. What is it called? It is called the Land of Toys. Why don't you come, too? I? Oh, no. You are making a big mistake, Pinocchio. Believe me, if you don't come, you'll be sorry. Where can you find a place that will agree better with you and me? No schools, no teachers, no books. In that blessed place there is no such thing as study. Here it is only on Saturdays that we have no school. In the land of toys, every day, except Sunday, is a Saturday. Vacation begins on the first of January and ends on the last day of December. That is the place for me. All countries should be like it. How happy we should all be! But how does one spend the day in the land of toys? Days are spent in play and enjoyment from morn till night. At night one goes to bed, and next morning the good times begin all over again. What do you think of it? Hmm. Nodding his wooden head as if to say, It's the kind of life which would agree with me perfectly. Do you want to go with me then? Yes or no? You must make up your mind. No, no, and again no. I have promised my kind fairy to become a good boy, and I want to keep my word. Just see, the sun is setting, and I must leave you and run. Good bye, and good luck to you. Where are you going in such a hurry? Home. My good fairy wants me to return home before night. Wait two minutes more. It's too late. Only two minutes. And if the fairy scolds me? Let her scold. After she gets tired, she will stop, said Lampwick. Are you going alone or with others? Alone? There will be more than a hundred of us. Will you walk? At midnight the wagon passes here that is to take us within the boundaries of that marvelous country. How I wish midnight would strike! Why? To see you all set out together. Stay here a while longer and you will see us. No, no, I want to return home. Wait two more minutes. I have waited too long as it is. The fairy will be worried. Poor fairy! Is she afraid the bats will eat you up? Listen, Lampwick, said the marionette. Are you really sure that there are no schools in the land of toys? Not even the shadow of one. Not even one teacher? Not one. And one does not have to study? Never, never, never. What a great land, said Pinocchio, feeling his mouth water. What a beautiful land! I have never been there, but I can well imagine it. Why don't you come too? It is useless for you to tempt me. I told you I promised my good fairy to behave myself, and I am going to keep my word. Goodbye, then, and remember me to the grammar schools, to the high schools, and even to the colleges, if you meet them on the way. Goodbye, Lampwick. Have a pleasant trip, enjoy yourself, and remember your friends once in a while. With these words the marionette started on his way home. Turning once more to his friend, he asked him, "'But are you sure that, in that country, each week is composed of six Saturdays and one Sunday?' "'Very sure.' "'And that vacation begins on the first of January and ends on the thirty-first of December?' "'Very, very sure.' "'What a great country!' repeated Pinocchio, puzzled as to what to do. Then, in sudden determination, he said hurriedly, "'Good-bye for the last time, and good luck!' "'Good-bye!' "'How soon will you go?' "'Within two hours.' "'What a pity! If it were only one hour, I might wait for you.' "'And the fairy?' "'By this time I'm late, and one hour more or less makes very little difference.' "'Poor Pinocchio! And if the fairy scolds you?' 
Oh, I'll let her scold. After she gets tired, she will stop. In the meantime, the night became darker and darker. All at once in the distance a small light flickered. A queer sound could be heard, soft as a little bell, and faint and muffled like the buzz of a faraway mosquito. "'There it is!' cried Lampwick, jumping to his feet. "'What?' whispered Pinocchio. "'The wagon which is coming to get me. For the last time, are you coming or not?' "'But is it really true that in that country boys never have to study?' "'Never, never, never!' "'What a wonderful, beautiful, marvellous country! Oh!' Drawn by twelve pair of donkeys, all of the same size, but all of different colour. Some were grey, others white, and still others a mixture of brown and black. Here and there were a few with large yellow and blue stripes. The strangest thing of all was that those twenty-four donkeys— instead of being iron-shod like any other beast of burden, had on their feet laced shoes made of leather, just like the ones boys wear. And the driver of the wagon? Imagine to yourselves a little fat man, much wider than he was long, round and shiny as a ball of butter, with a face beaming like an apple, a little mouth that always smiled, and a voice small and wheedling like that of a cat begging for food. No sooner did any boy see him than he fell in love with him, and nothing satisfied him but to be allowed to ride in his wagon to that lovely place called the Land of Toys. In fact, the wagon was so closely packed with boys of all ages that it looked like a box of sardines. They were uncomfortable, they were piled one on top of the other, they could hardly breathe, yet not one word of complaint was heard. The thought that in a few hours they would reach a country where there were no schools, no books, no teachers, made these boys so happy that they felt neither hunger, nor thirst, nor sleep, nor discomfort. No sooner had the wagon stopped than the little fat man turned to Lampwick. With bows and smiles he asked in a wheedling tone, "'Tell me, my fine boy, do you also want to come to my wonderful country? Indeed I do. But I warn you, my little dear, there's no more room in the wagon. It is full. Never mind, answered Lampwick. If there's no room inside, I can sit on the top of the coach. And with one leap he perched himself there. What about you, my love? asked the little man, turning politely to Pinocchio. What are you going to do? Will you come with us, or do you stay here? I stay here, answered Pinocchio. I want to return home, as I prefer to study and to succeed in life. May that bring you luck. Pinocchio, Lampwick called out, listen to me. Come with us, and we'll always be happy. No, no, no. Come with us, and we'll always be happy cried four other voices from the wagon. "'Come with us, and we'll always be happy!' shouted the one hundred and more boys in the wagon, all together. "'And if I go with you, what will my good fairy say?' asked the marionette, who was beginning to waver and weaken in his good resolutions. "'Don't worry so much. Only think that we are going to a land where we shall be allowed to make all the racket we like from morning till night.' Pinocchio did not answer, but sighed deeply once, twice, a third time. Finally he said, "'Make room for me! I want to go, too!' "'The seats are all filled,' answered the little man. "'But to show you how much I think of you, take my place as coachman.' "'And you?' "'I'll walk.' "'No, indeed! I could not permit such a thing.' I much prefer riding one of these donkeys," cried Pinocchio. No sooner said than done. He approached the first donkey and tried to mount it. But the little animal turned suddenly and gave him such a terrible kick in the stomach that Pinocchio was thrown to the ground and fell with his legs in the air. At this unlooked-for entertainment the whole company of runaways laughed uproariously. The little fat man did not laugh. 
he went up to the rebellious animal, and, still smiling, bent over him lovingly, and bit off half of his right ear. In the meantime, Pinocchio lifted himself up from the ground, and with one leap landed on the donkey's back. The leap was so well taken that all the boys shouted, Hurrah for Pinocchio! and clapped their hands in hearty applause. Suddenly the little donkey gave a kick with his two hind feet, and at this unexpected move the poor marionette found himself once again sprawling right in the middle of the road. Again the boys shouted with laughter. But the little man, instead of laughing, became so loving toward the little animal that, with another kiss, he bit off half of his left ear. "'You can mount now, my boy,' he then said to Pinocchio, "'Have no fear. That donkey was worried about something, but I have spoken to him, and now he seems quiet and reasonable.' Pinocchio mounted, and the wagon started on its way. While the donkeys galloped along the stony road, the marionette fancied he heard a very quiet voice whispering to him, "'Poor silly! You have done as you wished, but you are going to be a sorry boy before very long.' Pinocchio, greatly frightened, looked about him to see whence the words had come, but he saw no one. The donkeys galloped, the wagon rolled on smoothly, the boys slept, Lampwick snored like a dormouse, and the little fat man sang sleepily between his teeth. After a mile or so, Pinocchio again heard the same faint voice whispering, "'Remember, little simpleton, boys who stop studying and turn their backs upon books and schools and teachers, in order to give all their time to nonsense and pleasure, sooner or later come to grief. Oh, how well I know this! How well I can prove it to you!' A day will come when you will weep bitterly, even as I am weeping now. But it will be too late." At these whispered words, the marionette grew more and more frightened. He jumped to the ground, ran up to the donkey on whose back he had been riding, and taking his nose in his hands, looked at him. Think how great was his surprise when he saw that the donkey was weeping, weeping just like a boy. "'Hey, Mr. Driver!' cried the marionette. "'Do you know what strange thing is happening here? This donkey weeps!' "'Let him weep. When he gets married he will have time to laugh.' "'Have you perhaps taught him to speak?' "'No. He learned to mumble a few words when he lived for three years with the band of trained dogs.' "'Poor beast!' "'Come, come,' said the little man. Do not lose time over a donkey that can weep. Mount quickly, and let us go. The night is cool, and the road is long." Pinocchio obeyed without another word. The wagon started again. Toward dawn the next morning they finally reached that much longed-for country, the land of toys. This great land was entirely different from any other place in the world. Its population, large though it was, was composed wholly of boys. The oldest were about fourteen years of age, the youngest eight. In the street there was such a racket, such shouting, such blowing of trumpets, that it was deafening. Everywhere groups of boys were gathered together. Some played at marbles, at hopscotch, at ball. Others rode on bicycles or on wooden horses. Some played at blind man's bluff, others at tag. Here a group played circus, there another sang and recited. A few turned somersaults, others walked on their hands with their feet in the air. Generals in full uniform leading regiments of cardboard soldiers passed by. Laughter, shrieks, howls, catcalls, hand-clapping followed this parade. One boy made a noise like a hen, another like a rooster, and a third imitated a lion in his den. Altogether they created such a pandemonium that it would have been necessary for you to put cotton in your ears. The squares were filled with small wooden theatres, overflowing with boys from morning till night, and on the walls of the houses, written with charcoal, were words like these, Hurrah for the land of toys! Down with arithmetic! No more school! As soon as they had set foot in that land, 
Pinocchio, Lampwick, and all the other boys who had travelled with them started out on a tour of investigation. They wandered everywhere, they looked into every nook and corner, house and theatre. They became everybody's friend. Who could be happier than they? What with entertainments and parties, the hours, the days, the weeks passed like lightning. "'Oh, what a beautiful life this is!' said Pinocchio each time that, by chance, he met his friend Lampwick. "'Was I right or wrong?' answered Lampwick. "'And to think you did not want to come! To think that even yesterday the idea came into your head to return home to see your fairy, and to start studying again! If to-day you are free from pencils and books and school, you owe it to me, to my advice, to my care. Do you admit it? Only true friends count, after all. It's true, Lampwick, it's true. If to-day I am a really happy boy, it is all because of you. And to think that the teacher, when speaking of you, used to say, Do not go with that Lampwick. He is a bad companion, and some day he will lead you astray. Poor teacher! answered the other, nodding his head. Indeed I know how much he disliked me, and how he enjoyed speaking ill of me. But I am of a generous nature, and I gladly forgive him. Great soul! said Pinocchio, fondly embracing his friend. Five months passed, and the boys continued playing and enjoying themselves from morn till night, without ever seeing a book, or a desk, or a school. But, my children, there came a morning when Pinocchio awoke, and found a great surprise awaiting him, a surprise which made him feel very unhappy, as you shall see. CHAPTER Thirty Two. Everyone, at one time or another, has found some surprise awaiting him. Of the kind which Pinocchio had on that eventful morning of his life, there are but few. What was it? I will tell you, my dear little readers. On awakening, Pinocchio put his hand up to his head, and there he found— Guess! <laughs> he found that, during the night, his ears had grown at least ten full inches— you must know that the marionette, even from his birth, had very small ears, so small indeed that to the naked eye they could hardly be seen. Fancy how he felt when he noticed that overnight those two dainty organs had become as long as shoe-brushes. He went in search of a mirror, but not finding any, he just filled a basin with water and looked at himself. There he saw what he never could have wished to see— his manly figure was adorned and enriched by a beautiful pair of donkey's ears. I leave you to think of the terrible grief, the shame, the despair of the poor marionette. He began to cry, to scream, to knock his head against the wall, but the more he shrieked, the longer and the more hairy grew his ears. At those piercing shrieks a dormouse came into the room, a fat little dormouse, who lived upstairs. Seeing Pinocchio so grief-stricken, she asked him anxiously, "'What is the matter, dear little neighbor?' "'I am sick, my little dormouse, very, very sick, and from an illness which frightens me. Do you understand how to feel the pulse?' "'A little.' "'Feel mine, then, and tell me if I have a fever.' The dormouse took Pinocchio's wrist between her paws, and after a few minutes looked up at him sorrowfully and said, "'My friend, I am sorry, but I must give you some very sad news.' "'What is it?' "'You have a very bad fever.' "'But what fever is it?' "'The donkey fever.' "'I don't know anything about that fever,' answered the marionette, beginning to understand even too well what was happening to him. "'Then I will tell you all about it,' said the Dormouse. "'Know then that, within two or three hours, you will no longer be a marionette, nor a boy.' "'What shall I be?' "'Within two or three hours, you will become a real donkey, just like the ones that pull the fruit carts to market.' "'Oh, what have I done? What have I done?' cried Pinocchio, grasping his two long ears in his hands and pulling and tugging at them angrily, 
just as if they belonged to another. "'My dear boy,' answered the Dormouse, to cheer him up a bit, "'why worry now? What is done cannot be undone, you know. Fate has decreed that all lazy boys who come to hate books and schools and teachers, and spend all their days with toys and games, must sooner or later turn into donkeys.' "'But is it really so?' asked the marionette, sobbing bitterly. "'I am sorry to say it is. And tears are now useless. You should have thought of all this before.' "'But the fault is not mine. Believe me, little Dormouse, the fault is all Lampwick's.' "'And who is this Lampwick?' "'A classmate of mine. I wanted to return home. I wanted to be obedient. I wanted to study and to succeed in school, but Lampwick said to me, "'Why do you want to waste your time studying? Why do you want to go to school? Come with me to the land of toys. There we'll never study again. There we can enjoy ourselves and be happy from morn till night.' "'And why did you follow the advice of that false friend?' "'Why? Because, my dear little Dormouse, I am a heedless marionette.' heedless and heartless. Oh! If I had only had a bit of heart, I should never have abandoned that good fairy, who loved me so well and who has been so kind to me. And by this time I should no longer be a marionette. I should have become a real boy, like all these friends of mine. Oh! If I meet Lampwick I am going to tell him what I think of him, and more, too." After this long speech, Pinocchio walked to the door of the room, but when he reached it, remembering his donkey ears, he felt ashamed to show them to the public, and turned back. He took a large cotton bag from a shelf, put it on his head, and pulled it far down to his very nose. Thus adorned he went out. He looked for Lampwick everywhere, along the streets, in the squares, inside the theatres, everywhere, but he was not to be found. He asked every one whom he met about him, but no one had seen him. In desperation he returned home and knocked at the door. "'Who is it?' asked Lampwick from within. "'It is I,' answered the marionette. "'Wait a minute.' After a full half-hour the door opened. Another surprise awaited Pinocchio. There in the room stood his friend, with a large cotton bag on his head, pulled far down to his very nose. At the sight of that bag Pinocchio felt slightly happier, and thought to himself, "'My friend must be suffering from the same sickness that I am. I wonder if he, too, has donkey fever.' But pretending he had seen nothing, he asked with a smile, "'How are you, my dear Lampwick?' "'Very well. Like a mouse in a Parmesan cheese.' "'Is that really true?' "'Why should I lie to you?' "'I beg your pardon, my friend. But why, then, are you wearing that cotton bag over your ears?' "'The doctor has ordered it because one of my knees hurts. And you, dear marionette, why are you wearing that cotton bag down to your nose?' "'The doctor has ordered it because I have bruised my foot.' "'Oh, my poor Pinocchio!' Oh, my poor Lampwick! An embarrassingly long silence followed these words, during which time the two friends looked at each other in a mocking way. Finally the marionette, in a voice sweet as honey and soft as a flute, said to his companion, "'Tell me, Lampwick, dear friend, have you ever suffered from an earache?' "'Never. And you?' "'Never. Still, since this morning my ear has been torturing me. So has mine. Yours, too. And which ear is it? Both of them. And yours? Both of them, too. I wonder if it could be the same sickness. I'm afraid it is. Will you do me a favor, Lampwick? Gladly, with my whole heart. Will you let me see your ears? Why not? But before I show you mine, I want to see yours, dear Pinocchio. No, you must show yours first. No, my dear, yours first, then mine. 
"'Well, then,' said the marionette, "'let us make a contract.' "'Let's hear the contract.' "'Let us take off our caps together, all right?' "'All right.' "'Ready, then.' Pinocchio began to count. "'One, two, three. At the word three, the two boys pulled off their caps and threw them high in the air. And then a scene took place which is hard to believe, but it is all too true. The marionette and his friend Lampwick, when they saw each other both stricken by the same misfortune, instead of feeling sorrowful and ashamed, began to poke fun at each other, and after much nonsense they ended by bursting out into hearty laughter. They laughed and laughed, and laughed again, laughed till they ached, laughed till they cried. But all of a sudden Lampwick stopped laughing. He tottered and almost fell. Pale as a ghost, he turned to Pinocchio and said, "'Help! Help, Pinocchio!' "'What is the matter?' "'Oh, help me! I can no longer stand up!' "'I can't either!' cried Pinocchio, and his laughter turned to tears as he stumbled about helplessly. They had hardly finished speaking, when both of them fell on all fours and began running and jumping around the room. As they ran, their arms turned into legs, their faces lengthened into snouts, and their backs became covered with long gray hairs. This was humiliation enough, but the most horrible moment was the one in which the two poor creatures felt their tails appear. Overcome with shame and grief, they tried to cry and bemoan their fate. But what is done can't be undone. Instead of moans and cries, they burst forth into loud donkey brays, which sounded very much like, Haw! 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 At that moment a loud knocking was heard at the door, and a voice called to them. "'Open! I am the little man, the driver of the wagon which brought you here. Open, I say, or beware!' Chapter 33 Very sad and downcast were the two poor little fellows as they stood and looked at each other. Outside the room the little man grew more and more impatient, and finally gave the door such a violent kick that it flew open. With his usual sweet smile on his lips, he looked at Pinocchio and Lampwick and said to them, "'Fine work, boys! You have brayed well, so well that I recognize your voices immediately, and here I am!' On hearing this the two donkeys bowed their heads in shame, dropped their ears, and put their tails between their legs. At first the little man petted and caressed them, and smoothed down their hairy coats. Then he took out a curry-comb and worked over them till they shone like glass. Satisfied with the looks of the two little animals, he bridled them and took them to a market-place far away from the land of toys, in the hope of selling them at a good price. In fact, he did not have to wait very long for an offer. Lampwick was bought by a farmer whose donkey had died the day before. Pinocchio went to the owner of a circus, who wanted to teach him to do tricks for his audiences. And now you understand what the little man's profession was? This horrid little being, whose face shone with kindness, went about the world looking for boys. Lazy boys, boys who hated books, boys who wanted to run away from home, boys who were tired of school. All these were his joy and his fortune. He took them with him to the land of toys and let them enjoy themselves to their heart's content. When, after months of all play and no work, they became little donkeys, he sold them on the marketplace. In a few years he had become a millionaire. What happened to Lampwick? My dear children, I do not know. Pinocchio, I can tell you, met with great hardships, even from the first day. After putting him in a stable, his new master filled his manger with straw, but Pinocchio, after tasting a mouthful, spat it out. Then the man filled the manger with hay, but Pinocchio did not like that any better. "'Ah, you don't like hay either!' he cried angrily. "'Wait, my pretty donkey, I'll teach you not to be so particular!' Without more ado, he took a whip and gave the donkey a hearty blow across the legs. Pinocchio screamed with pain, 
and as he screamed he brayed, Yaw! 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 I can't digest straw! Then eat the hay, answered his master, who understood the donkey perfectly. Yaw! 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 Hay gives me a headache! Do you pretend, by any chance, that I should feed you duck or chicken? asked the man again, and angrier than ever he gave poor Pinocchio another lashing. At that second beating Pinocchio became very quiet and said no more. After that the door of the stable was closed and he was left alone. It was many hours since he had eaten anything, and he started to yawn from hunger. As he yawned, he opened a mouth as big as an oven. Finally, not finding anything else in the manger, he tasted the hay. After tasting it, he chewed it well, closed his eyes, and swallowed it. "'This hay is not bad,' he said to himself. "'But how much happier I should be if I had studied! Just now, instead of hay, I should be eating some good bread and butter. Patience!' Next morning, when he awoke, Pinocchio looked in the manger for more hay, but it was all gone. He had eaten it all during the night. He tried the straw, but as he chewed away at it, he noticed to his great disappointment that it tasted neither like rice nor like macaroni. Patience, he repeated as he chewed. If only my misfortune might serve as a lesson to disobedient boys who refuse to study. Patience! Have patience! Patience, indeed! shouted his master just then, as he came into the stable. Do you think, perhaps, my little donkey, that I have brought you here only to give you food and drink? Oh, no! You are to help me earn some fine gold pieces, do you hear? Come along now. I am going to teach you to jump and bow, to dance a waltz and a polka, and even to stand on your head. Poor Pinocchio! whether he liked it or not, had to learn all these wonderful things. But it took him three long months, and cost him many, many lashings before he was pronounced perfect. The day came at last when Pinocchio's master was able to announce an extraordinary performance. The announcements, posted all around the town, and written in large letters, read thus, "'Great spectacle to-night!' Leaps and exercises by the great artists and the famous horses of the company. First public appearance of the famous donkey called Pinocchio, the star of the dance. The theatre will be as light as day. That night, as you can well imagine, the theatre was filled to overflowing one hour before the show was scheduled to start. Not an orchestra chair could be had, not a balcony seat, nor a gallery seat, not even for their weight in gold. The place swarmed with boys and girls of all ages and sizes, wriggling and dancing about in a fever of impatience to see the famous donkey dance. When the first part of the performance was over, the owner and manager of the circus, in a black coat, white knee-breeches, and patent leather boots, presented himself to the public, and in a loud, pompous voice made the following announcement. Most honoured friends, gentlemen and ladies, your humble servant, the manager of this theatre, presents himself before you to-night in order to introduce to you the greatest, the most famous donkey in the world, a donkey that has had the great honour in his short life of performing before the kings and queens and emperors of all the great courts of Europe. We thank you for your attention." This speech was greeted by much laughter and applause, and the applause grew to a roar when Pinocchio, the famous donkey, appeared in the circus ring. He was handsomely arrayed. A new bridle of shining leather with buckles of polished brass was on his back. Two white camellias were tied to his ears. Ribbons and tassels of red silk adorned his mane, which was divided into many curls. A great sash of gold and silver was fastened around his waist, and his tail was decorated with ribbons of many brilliant colours. He was a handsome donkey indeed. The manager, when introducing him to the public, added these words, "'Most honoured audience, I shall not take your time to-night to tell you of the great difficulties which I have encountered 
while trying to tame this animal, since I found him in the wilds of Africa. Observe, I beg of you, the savage look of his eye. All the means used by centuries of civilizations in subduing wild beasts failed in this case. I had finally to resort to the gentle language of the whip, in order to bring him to my will. With all my kindness, however, I never succeeded in gaining my donkey's love. He is still to-day as savage as the day I found him. He still fears and hates me, but I have found in him one great redeeming feature. Do you see this little bump on his forehead? It is this bump which gives him his great talent of dancing, and using his feet as nimbly as a human being. Admire him, O oh Signore, and enjoy yourselves. I let you, now, be the judges of my success as a teacher of animals. Before I leave you, I wish to state that there will be another performance to-morrow night. If the weather threatens rain, the great spectacle will take place at eleven o'clock in the morning." The manager bowed and then turned to Pinocchio and said, "'Ready, Pinocchio? Before starting your performance, salute your audience.' Pinocchio obediently bent his two knees to the ground, and remained kneeling, until the manager, with the crack of the whip, cried sharply, Walk! The donkey lifted himself on his four feet, and walked around the ring. A few minutes passed, and again the voice of the manager called, Quick step! And Pinocchio obediently changed his step. Gallop! And Pinocchio galloped. Full speed! And Pinocchio ran as fast as he could. As he ran, the master raised his arm, and a pistol-shot rang in the air. At the shot, the little donkey fell to the ground as if he were really dead. A shower of applause greeted the donkey as he arose to his feet. Cries and shouts and hand-clappings were heard on all sides. At all that noise, Pinocchio lifted his head and raised his eyes. There in front of him, in a box, sat a beautiful woman. Around her neck she wore a long gold chain, from which hung a large medallion. On the medallion was painted the picture of a marionette. "'That picture is of me! That beautiful lady is my fairy!' said Pinocchio to himself, recognizing her. He felt so happy that he tried his best to cry out, "'Oh, my fairy! Oh, my fairy!' But instead of words a loud braying was heard in the theatre so loud and so long that all the spectators, men, women, and children, but especially the children, burst out laughing. Then, in order to teach the donkey that it was not good manners to bray before the public, the manager hit him on the nose with the handle of the whip. The poor little donkey stuck out a long tongue and licked his nose for a long time in an effort to take away the pain. And what was his grief when on looking up toward the boxes, he saw that the fairy had disappeared. He felt himself fainting, his eyes filled with tears, and he wept bitterly. No one knew it, however, least of all the manager, who, cracking his whip, cried out, "'Bravo, Pinocchio! Now show us how gracefully you can jump through the rings!' Pinocchio tried two or three times, but each time he came near the ring, he found it more to his taste to go under it. The fourth time, at a look from his master, he leaped through it, but as he did so his hind legs caught in the ring, and he fell to the floor in a heap. When he got up he was lame and could hardly limp as far as the stable. "'Pinocchio! We want Pinocchio! We want the little donkey!' cried the boys from the orchestra, saddened by the accident. No one saw Pinocchio again that evening. The next morning the veterinary, that is, the animal doctor, declared that he would be lame for the rest of his life. "'What do I want with a lame donkey?' said the manager to the stable-boy. "'Take him to the market and sell him.' When they reached the square, a buyer was soon found. "'How much do you want for that little lame donkey?' he asked. Four dollars. "'I'll give you four cents. Don't think I'm buying him for work. I only want his skin.' It looks very tough, and I can use it to make myself a drumhead. I belong to a musical band in my village, and I need a drum. 
I leave it to you, my dear children, to picture to yourself the great pleasure with which Pinocchio heard that he was to become a drumhead. As soon as the buyer had paid the four cents, the donkey changed hands. His new owner took him to a high cliff overlooking the sea, put a stone around his neck, tied a rope to one of his hind feet, gave him a push, and threw him into the water. Pinocchio sank immediately, and his new master sat on the cliff waiting for him to drown, so as to skin him and make himself a drumhead. Chapter 34 Down into the sea, deeper and deeper, sank Pinocchio, and finally, after fifty minutes of waiting, the man on the cliff said to himself, By this time my poor little lame donkey must be drowned. Up with him, and then I can get to work on my beautiful drum. He pulled the rope which he had tied to Pinocchio's leg, pulled and pulled and pulled, and at last he saw appear on the surface of the water. Can you guess what? Instead of a dead donkey, he saw a very much alive marionette, wriggling and squirming like an eel. Seeing that wooden marionette, the poor man thought he was dreaming, and sat there with his mouth wide open and his eyes popping out of his head. Gathering his wits together, he said, "'And the donkey I threw into the sea?' "'I am that donkey,' answered the marionette, laughing. "'You?' "'I.' "'Aw, oh, you little cheat! Are you poking fun at me?' "'Poking fun at you? Not at all, dear master. I am talking seriously. But then how is it that you, who a few minutes ago were a donkey, are now standing before me a wooden marionette? It may be the effect of salt water. The sea is fond of playing these tricks. Be careful, marionette, be careful. Don't laugh at me. Woe be to you if I lose my patience. Well then, my master, do you want to know my whole story? Untie my leg, and I can tell it to you better." The old fellow, curious to know the true story of the marionette's life, immediately untied the rope which held his foot. Pinocchio, feeling free as a bird of the air, began his tale. "'Know, then, that once upon a time I was a wooden marionette, just as I am to-day. One day I was about to become a boy, a real boy but on account of my laziness and my hatred of books, and because I listened to bad companions, I ran away from home. One beautiful morning I awoke to find myself changed into a donkey. Long ears, gray coat, even a tail. What a shameful day for me! I hope you will never experience one like it, dear master. I was taken to the fair and sold to a circus owner, who tried to make me dance and jump through the rings. One night, during a performance, I had a bad fall and became lame. Not knowing what to do with a lame donkey, the circus owner sent me to the marketplace, and you bought me. Indeed I did, and I paid four cents for you. Now who will return my money to me? But why did you buy me? You bought me to do me harm, to kill me, to make a drumhead out of me. Indeed I did. And now where shall I find another skin? Never mind, dear master, there are so many donkeys in this world. Tell me, impudent little rogue, does your story end here? One more word, answered the marionette, and I am through. After buying me, you brought me here to kill me. But feeling sorry for me, you tied a stone to my neck and threw me to the bottom of the sea. That was very good and kind of you to want me to suffer as little as possible, and I shall remember you always. And now my fairy will take care of me, even if you— Your fairy? Who is she? She is my mother, and, like all other mothers who love their children, she never loses sight of me, even though I do not deserve it. And today this good fairy of mine, as soon as she saw me in danger of drowning, sent a thousand fishes to the spot where I lay. They thought I was really a dead donkey and began to eat me. What great bites they took! One ate my ears, another my nose, a third my neck and my mane. Some went at my legs and some at my back, 
and among the others there was one tiny fish so gentle and polite that he did me the great favor of eating even my tail. "'From now on,' said the man, horrified, "'I swear I shall never again taste fish. How I should enjoy opening a mullet or a whitefish just to find there the tail of a dead donkey!' "'I think as you do,' answered the marionette, laughing. "'Still, you must know that when the fish finished eating my donkey coat, which covered me from head to foot, they naturally came to the bones, or rather, in my case, to the wood, for, as you know, I am made of very hard wood. After the first few bites, those greedy fish found out that the wood was not good for their teeth, and, afraid of indigestion, they turned and ran here and there without saying good-bye, or even as much as thank you to me. Here, dear master, you have my story." You know now why you found a marionette, and not a dead donkey, when you pulled me out of the water." "'I laugh at your story,' cried the man angrily. "'I know that I spent four cents to get you, and I want my money back. Do you know what I can do? I am going to take you to the market once more, and sell you as dry firewood.' "'Very well. Sell me. I am satisfied,' said Pinocchio. But as he spoke, he gave a quick leap and dived into the sea. Swimming away as fast as he could, he cried out, laughing, "'Good-bye, master! If you ever need a skin for your drum, remember me!' He swam on and on. After a while he turned around again and called louder than before, "'Good-bye, master! If you ever need a piece of good dry firewood, remember me!' In a few seconds he had gone so far he could hardly be seen. All that could be seen of him was a very small black dot moving swiftly on the blue surface of the water, a little black dot which now and then lifted a leg or an arm in the air. One would have thought that Pinocchio had turned into a porpoise, playing in the sun. After swimming for a long time, Pinocchio saw a large rock in the middle of the sea, a rock as white as marble. High on the rock stood a little goat, bleating and calling and beckoning to the marionette to come to her. There was something very strange about that little goat. Her coat was not white or black or brown as that of any other goat, but azure, a deep, brilliant color that reminded one of the hair of the lovely maiden. Pinocchio's heart beat fast, and then faster and faster. He redoubled his efforts and swam as hard as he could toward the white rock. He was almost halfway over, when suddenly a horrible sea-monster stuck its head out of the water, an enormous head with a huge mouth, wide open, showing three rows of gleaming teeth, the mere sight of which would have filled you with fear. Do you know what it was? That sea-monster was no other than the enormous shark which has often been mentioned in the story, and which, on account of its cruelty, had been nicknamed the Attila of the Sea, by both fish and fishermen. Poor Pinocchio! The sight of that monster frightened him almost to death. He tried to swim away from him, to change his path, to escape, but that immense mouth kept coming nearer and nearer. "'Hasten, Pinocchio, I beg you!' bleated the little goat on the high rock. And Pinocchio swam desperately with his arms, his body, his legs, his feet. "'Quick, Pinocchio! The monster is coming nearer!' Pinocchio swam faster and faster, and harder and harder. "'Faster, Pinocchio! The monster will get you! There he is! There he is! Quick, quick, or you are lost!' Pinocchio went through the water like a shot. Swifter and swifter, he came close to the rock. The goat leaned over and gave him one of her hoofs to help him up out of the water. Alas, it was too late! The monster overtook him, and the marionette found himself in between the rows of gleaming white teeth. Only for a moment, however, for the shark took a deep breath, and, as he breathed, he drank in the marionette as easily as he would have sucked an egg. Then he swallowed him so fast that Pinocchio, falling down into the body of the fish, lay stunned for a half hour. When he recovered his senses, the marionette could not remember where he was. 
Around him all was darkness, a darkness so deep and so black that for a moment he thought he had put his head into an inkwell. He listened for a few moments and heard nothing. Once in a while a cold wind blew on his face. At first he could not understand where that wind was coming from, but after a while he understood that it came from the lungs of the monster. I forgot to tell you that the shark was suffering from asthma, so that whenever he breathed a storm seemed to blow. Pinocchio at first tried to be brave, but as soon as he became convinced that he was really and truly in the shark's stomach, he burst into sobs and tears. "'Help! Help!' he cried. "'Oh, poor me! Won't someone come to save me?' "'Who is there to help you, unhappy boy?' said a rough voice, like a guitar out of tune. "'Who is talking?' asked Pinocchio, frozen with terror. "'It is I, a poor tunny swallowed by the shark at the same time as you. And what kind of a fish are you?' "'I have nothing to do with fishes. I am a marionette.' "'If you are not a fish, why did you let this monster swallow you?' "'I didn't let him. He chased me and swallowed me without even a by your leave.' And now what are we to do here in the dark? Wait until this shark has digested us both, I suppose. But I don't want to be digested, shouted Pinocchio, starting to sob. Neither do I, said the Tunny. But I am wise enough to think that if one is born a fish, it is more dignified to die under the water than in the frying pan. What nonsense, cried Pinocchio. "'Mine is an opinion,' replied the Tunny, "'and opinions should be respected.' "'But I want to get out of this place. I want to escape.' "'Go, if you can.' "'Is this shark that has swallowed us very long?' asked the marionette. "'His body, not counting the tail, is almost a mile long.' While talking in the darkness, Pinocchio thought he saw a faint light in the distance. "'What can that be?' he said to the Tunny. "'Some other poor fish, waiting as patiently as we to be digested by the shark.' "'I want to see him. He may be an old fish and may know some way of escape.' "'I wish you all good luck, dear Marionette.' "'Good-bye, Tunny.' "'Good-bye, Marionette, and good luck.' "'When shall I see you again?' "'Who knows? It is better not to think about it.' Chapter 35 Pinocchio, as soon as he had said good-bye to his good friend, the Tunny, tottered away in the darkness and began to walk as well as he could toward the faint light which glowed in the distance. As he walked his feet splashed in a pool of greasy and slippery water, which had such a heavy smell of fish fried in oil that Pinocchio thought it was Lent. The farther on he went, the brighter and clearer grew the tiny light. On and on he walked, until finally he found— I give you a thousand guesses, my dear children. He found a little table set for dinner, and lighted by a candle stuck in a glass bottle, and near the table sat a little old man, white as the snow, eating live fish. They wriggled so that, now and again, one of them slipped out of the old man's mouth and escaped into the darkness under the table. At this sight— the poor marionette was filled with such great and sudden happiness that he almost dropped in a faint. He wanted to laugh. He wanted to cry. He wanted to say a thousand and one things. But all he could do was to stand still, stuttering and stammering brokenly. At last, with a great effort, he was able to let out a scream of joy, and, opening wide his arms, he threw them around the old man's neck. "'Oh, father! Dear father! Have I found you at last? Now I shall never, never leave you again!' "'Are my eyes really telling me the truth?' answered the old man, rubbing his eyes. "'Are you really my own dear Pinocchio?' "'Yes, yes, yes! It is I! Look at me! And you have forgiven me, haven't you? Oh, my dear father, how good you are!' and to think that I—oh, but if you only knew how many misfortunes have fallen on my head, 
and how many troubles I have had! Just think that on the day you sold your old coat to buy me my ABC book so that I could go to school, I ran away to the marionette theatre, and the proprietor caught me and wanted to burn me to cook his roast lamb. He was the one who gave me the five gold pieces for you, but I met the fox and the cat, who took me to the inn of the Red Lobster. There they ate like wolves, and I left the inn alone, and I met the assassins in the wood. I ran, and they ran after me, always after me, till they hanged me to the branch of a giant oak tree. Then the fairy of the azure hair sent the coach to rescue me, and the doctors, after looking at me, said, If he is not dead, then he is surely alive. And then I told a lie, and my nose began to grow. It grew and it grew, till I couldn't get it through the door of the room. And then I went with the fox and the cat to the field of wonders to bury the gold pieces. The parrot laughed at me, and instead of two thousand gold pieces I found none. When the judge heard I had been robbed, he sent me to jail to make the thieves happy, and when I came away I saw a fine bunch of grapes hanging on a vine. The trap caught me, and the farmer put a collar on me and made me a watchdog. He found out I was innocent when I caught the weasels, and he let me go. The serpent with the tail that smoked started to laugh, and a vein in his chest broke, and so I went back to the fairy's house. She was dead, and the pigeon, seeing me crying, said to me, I have seen your father building a boat to look for you in America. And I said to him, Oh, if I only had wings! And he said to me, Do you want to go to your father? And I said, Perhaps, but how? And he said, Get on my back, I'll take you there. We flew all night long, and next morning the fishermen were looking toward the sea, crying, There is a poor little man drowning. And I knew it was you, because my heart told me so, and I waved to you from the shore. I knew you also, put in Geppetto, and I wanted to go to you, but how could I? The sea was rough, and the white caps overturned the boat. Then a terrible shark came up out of the sea, and as soon as he saw me in the water, swam quickly toward me, put out his tongue, and swallowed me as easily as if I had been a chocolate peppermint. And how long have you been shut away in here? From that day to this, two long, weary years. Two years, my Pinocchio, which have been like two centuries. And how have you lived? Where did you get the candle? And the matches with which to light it? Where did you get them? You must know that. In the storm which swamped my boat, a large ship also suffered the same fate. The sailors were all saved, but the ship went right to the bottom of the sea, and the same terrible shark that swallowed me swallowed most of it. What? Swallowed a ship? asked Pinocchio in astonishment. At one gulp. The only thing he spat out was the mainmast, for it stuck in his teeth. To my own good luck— that ship was loaded with meat, preserved foods, crackers, bread, bottles of wine, raisins, cheese, coffee, sugar, wax candles, and boxes of matches. With all these blessings I have been able to live happily on for two whole years. But now I am at the very last crumbs. Today there is nothing left in the cupboard, and this candle you see here is the last one I have. And then? And then, my dear, we'll find ourselves in darkness. Then, my dear father, said Pinocchio, there is no time to lose. We must try to escape. Escape? How? We can run out of the shark's mouth and dive into the sea. You speak well, but I cannot swim, my dear Pinocchio. Why should that matter? You can climb on my shoulders— and I, who am a fine swimmer, will carry you safely to the shore. Dreams, my boy, answered Geppetto, shaking his head and smiling sadly. Do you think it possible for a marionette, a yard high, to have the strength to carry me on his shoulders and swim? Try it and see, and in any case, 
If it is written that we must die, we shall at least die together. Not adding another word, Pinocchio took the candle in his hand, and going ahead to light the way, he said to his father, Follow me, and have no fear. They walked a long distance through the stomach and the whole body of the shark. When they reached the throat of the monster, they stopped for a while to wait for the right moment in which to make their escape. I want you to know that the shark, being very old and suffering from asthma and heart trouble, was obliged to sleep with his mouth open. Because of this, Pinocchio was able to catch a glimpse of the sky filled with stars, as he looked up through the open jaws of his new home. "'The time has come for us to escape,' he whispered, turning to his father. "'The shark is fast asleep. The sea is calm, and the night is as bright as day. Follow me closely, dear father, and we shall soon be saved.' No sooner said than done. They climbed up the throat of the monster till they came to that immense open mouth. There they had to walk on tiptoes, for if they tickled the shark's long tongue, he might awaken, and where would they be then? The tongue was so wide and so long that it looked like a country road. The two fugitives were just about to dive into the sea, when the shark sneezed very suddenly, and, as he sneezed, he gave Pinocchio and Geppetto such a jolt that they found themselves thrown on their backs, and dashed once more, and very unceremoniously, into the stomach of the monster. To make matters worse, the candle went out, and father and son were left in the dark. "'And now?' asked Pinocchio, with a serious face. "'Now we are lost.' "'Why lost? Give me your hand, dear father, and be careful not to slip. Where will you take me? We must try again. Come with me, and don't be afraid. With these words Pinocchio took his father by the hand, and, always walking on tiptoes, they climbed up the monster's throat for a second time. They then crossed the whole tongue and jumped over three rows of teeth. But before they took the last great leap, the marionette said to his father, Climb on my back and hold on tightly to my neck. I'll take care of everything else. As soon as Geppetto was comfortably seated on his shoulders, Pinocchio, very sure of what he was doing, dived into the water and started to swim. The sea was like oil, the moon shone in all splendor, and the shark continued to sleep so soundly that not even a cannon shot would have awakened him. CHAPTER Thirty Six. "'My dear father, we are saved!' cried the marionette. "'All we have to do now is to get to the shore, and that is easy.' Without another word he swam swiftly away in an effort to reach land as soon as possible. All at once he noticed that Geppetto was shivering and shaking, as if with a high fever. Was he shivering from fear or from cold? Who knows? Perhaps a little of both. But Pinocchio, thinking his father was frightened, tried to comfort him by saying, "'Courage, father! In a few moments we shall be safe on land.' "'But where is that blessed shore?' asked the little old man, more and more worried as he tried to pierce the faraway shadows. "'Here I am searching on all sides, and I see nothing but sea and sky.' "'I see the shore,' said the marionette. "'Remember, father, that I am like a cat.' I see better at night than by day." Poor Pinocchio pretended to be peaceful and contented, but he was far from that. He was beginning to feel discouraged. His strength was leaving him, and his breathing was becoming more and more labored. He felt he could not go on much longer, and the shore was still far away. He swam a few more strokes. Then he turned to Geppetto and cried out weakly, Help me, father, help, for I am dying. Father and son were really about to drown, when they heard a voice like a guitar out of tune call from the sea, What is the trouble? It is I and my poor father. I know the voice. You are Pinocchio. Exactly. And you? 
I am the Tunny, your companion in the shark's stomach. And how did you escape? I imitated your example. You were the one who showed me the way, and after you went, I followed. Tunny, you arrived at the right moment. I implore you, for the love you bear your children, the little Tunnies, to help us, or we are lost. With great pleasure, indeed. Hang on to my tail, both of you, and let me lead you. In a twinkling, you will be safe on land. Geppetto and Pinocchio, as you can easily imagine, did not refuse the invitation. Indeed, instead of hanging on to the tail, they thought it better to climb on the tunny's back. "'Are we too heavy?' asked Pinocchio. "'Heavy? Not in the least. You are as light as seashells,' answered the tunny, who was as large as a two-year-old horse. As soon as they reached the shore, Pinocchio was the first to jump to the ground to help his old father. Then he turned to the fish and said to him, "'Dear friend, you have saved my father, and I have not enough words with which to thank you. Allow me to embrace you as a sign of my eternal gratitude.' The tunny stuck his nose out of the water, and Pinocchio knelt on the sand and kissed him most affectionately on his cheek. At this warm greeting the poor tunny, who was not used to such tenderness, wept like a child. He felt so embarrassed and ashamed that he turned quickly, plunged into the sea, and disappeared. In the meantime day had dawned. Pinocchio offered his arm to Geppetto, who was so weak he could hardly stand, and said to him, "'Lean on my arm, dear father, and let us go. We will walk very, very slowly, and if we feel tired, we can rest by the wayside.' "'And where are we going?' asked Geppetto. "'To look for a house or a hut, well, they will be kind enough to give us a bite of bread and a bit of straw to sleep on.' They had not taken a hundred steps when they saw two rough-looking individuals sitting on a stone begging for alms. It was the fox and the cat, but one could hardly recognize them, they looked so miserable. The cat, after pretending to be blind for so many years, had really lost the sight of both eyes. And the fox, old, thin, and almost hairless, had even lost his tail. That sly thief had fallen into deepest poverty, and one day he had been forced to sell his beautiful tail for a bite to eat. "'Oh, Pinocchio!' he cried in a tearful voice. "'Give us some alms, we beg of you. We are old, tired, and sick.' "'Sick?' repeated the cat. "'Adio, false friends!' answered the marionette. You cheated me once, but you will never catch me again. Believe us, today we are truly poor and starving. Starving, repeated the cat. If you are poor, you deserve it. Remember the old proverb which says, Stolen money never bears fruit. Adio, false friends. Have mercy on us, on us. Adio, false friends. Remember the old proverb which says, Bad wheat always makes poor bread. Do not abandon us. Abandon us, repeated the cat. Adio, false friends. Remember the old proverb, Whoever steals his neighbor's shirt usually dies without his own. Waving goodbye to them, Pinocchio and Geppetto calmly went on their way. After a few more steps, they saw, at the end of a long road near a clump of trees, a tiny cottage built of straw. "'Someone must live in that little hut,' said Pinocchio. "'Let us see for ourselves.' They went and knocked at the door. "'Who is it?' said a little voice from within. "'A poor father and a poorer son, without food and with no roof to cover them,' answered the marionette. "'Turn the key, and the door will open,' said the same little voice. Pinocchio turned the key, and the door opened. As soon as they went in, they looked here and there and everywhere, but saw no one. "'Oh! Oh! Where is the owner of the hut?' cried Pinocchio, very much surprised. "'Here I am, up here!' Father and son looked up to the ceiling, and there on a beam sat the talking cricket. "'Oh! My dear cricket!' 
said Pinocchio, bowing politely. Oh, now you call me your dear cricket. But do you remember when you threw your hammer at me to kill me? You are right, dear cricket. Throw a hammer at me now. I deserve it. But spare my poor old father. I am going to spare both the father and the son. I have only wanted to remind you of the trick you long ago played upon me, to teach you that in this world of ours we must be kind and courteous to others, if we want to find kindness and courtesy in our own days of trouble. You are right, little cricket. You are more than right, and I shall remember the lesson you have taught me. But will you tell how you succeeded in buying this pretty little cottage? This cottage was given to me yesterday by a little goat with blue hair. And where did the goat go? asked Pinocchio. I don't know. And when will she come back? She will never come back. Yesterday she went away bleeding sadly, and it seemed to me she said, Poor Pinocchio, I shall never see him again. The shark must have eaten him by this time. Were those her real words? Then it was she, it was my dear little fairy, cried out Pinocchio, sobbing bitterly. After he had cried a long time, he wiped his eyes, and then he made a bed of straw for old Geppetto. He laid him on it, and said to the talking cricket, Tell me, little cricket, where shall I find a glass of milk for my poor father? Three fields away from here lives Farmer John. He has some cows. Go there, and he will give you what you want. Pinocchio ran all the way to Farmer John's house. The farmer said to him, How much milk do you want? I want a full glass. A full glass costs a penny. First give me the penny. I have no penny, answered Pinocchio, sad and ashamed. Very bad, my marionette, answered the farmer. Very bad. If you have no penny, I have no milk. Too bad, said Pinocchio, and started to go. Wait a moment, said Farmer John. Perhaps we can come to terms. Do you know how to draw water from a well? I can try. Then go to that well you see yonder, and draw one hundred bucketfuls of water. Very well. After you have finished, I shall give you a glass of warm sweet milk. I am satisfied. Farmer John took the marionette to the well, and showed him how to draw the water. Pinocchio set to work as well as he knew how, but long before he had pulled up the one hundred buckets, he was tired out and dripping with perspiration. He had never worked so hard in his life. "'Until to-day,' said the farmer, "'my donkey has drawn the water for me, but now that poor animal is dying.' "'Will you take me to see him?' said Pinocchio. "'Gladly.' As soon as Pinocchio went into the stable, he spied a little donkey lying on a bed of straw in the corner of the stable. He was worn out from hunger and too much work. After looking at him a long time, he said to himself, "'I know that donkey. I have seen him before.' And bending low over him, he asked, "'Who are you?' At this question the donkey opened weary, dying eyes, and answered in the same tongue, I am Lampwick. Then he closed his eyes and died. Oh, my poor Lampwick, said Pinocchio in a faint voice, as he wiped his eyes with some straw he had picked up from the ground. Do you feel so sorry for a little donkey that has cost you nothing? said the farmer. What should I do? I, who have paid my good money for him. But, you see— he was my friend. Your friend? A classmate of mine. What? shouted Farmer John, bursting out laughing. What? You had donkeys in your school? How you must have studied! The marionette, ashamed and hurt by these words, did not answer, but taking his glass of milk returned to his father. From that day on, for more than five months, Pinocchio got up every morning just as dawn was breaking, and went to the farm to draw water. And every day he was given a glass of warm milk for his poor old father, 
who grew stronger and better day by day. But he was not satisfied with this. He learned to make baskets of reeds and sold them. With the money he received, he and his father were able to keep from starving. Among other things, he built a rolling chair, strong and comfortable, to take his old father out for an airing on bright sunny days. In the evening the marionette studied by lamplight. With some of the money he had earned, he bought himself a second-hand volume that had a few pages missing, and with that he learned to read in a very short time. As far as writing was concerned, he used a long stick at one end of which he had whittled a long fine point. Ink he had none, so he used the juice of blackberries or cherries. Little by little his diligence was rewarded. He succeeded, not only in his studies, but also in his work, and a day came when he put enough money together to keep his old father comfortable and happy. Besides this, he was able to save the great amount of fifty pennies. With it he wanted to buy himself a new suit. One day he said to his father, "'I am going to the marketplace to buy myself a coat, a cap, and a pair of shoes. When I come back I'll be so dressed up, you will think I am a rich man.' He ran out of the house and up the road to the village, laughing and singing. Suddenly he heard his name called, and looking around to see whence the voice came, he noticed a large snail crawling out of some bushes. "'Don't you recognize me?' said the snail. "'Yes and no. Do you remember the snail that lived with the fairy with azure hair? Do you not remember how she opened the door for you one night, and gave you something to eat?' "'I remember everything!' cried Pinocchio. "'Answer me quickly, pretty snail. Where have you left my fairy? What is she doing? Has she forgiven me?' Does she remember me? Does she still love me? Is she very far away from here? May I see her?" At all these questions, tumbling out one after another, the snail answered, calm as ever, "'My dear Pinocchio, the fairy is lying ill in a hospital.' "'In a hospital?' "'Yes, indeed. She has been stricken with trouble and illness, and she hasn't a penny left with which to buy a bite of bread. Really? Oh, how sorry I am! My poor dear little fairy! If I had a million I should run to her with it. But I have only fifty pennies. Here they are. I was just going to buy some clothes. Here, take them, little snail, and give them to my good fairy. What about the new clothes? What does that matter? I should like to sell these rags I have on to help her more. Go and hurry! Come back here within a couple of days, and I hope to have more money for you. Until today I have worked for my father. Now I shall have to work for my mother also. Good-bye, and I hope to see you soon." The snail, much against her usual habit, began to run like a lizard under a summer sun. When Pinocchio returned home, his father asked him, "'And where is the new suit?' "'I couldn't find one to fit me. I shall have to look again some other day." That night Pinocchio, instead of going to bed at ten o'clock, waited until midnight, and instead of making eight baskets, he made sixteen. After that he went to bed and fell asleep. As he slept he dreamed of his fairy, beautiful, smiling, and happy, who kissed him and said to him, "'Bravo, Pinocchio! In reward for your kind heart, I forgive you for all your old mischief. Boys who love and take good care of their parents when they are old and sick deserve praise, even though they may not be held up as models of obedience and good behavior. Keep on doing so well, and you will be happy." At that very moment Pinocchio awoke and opened wide his eyes. What was his surprise and his joy when, on looking himself over, he saw that he was no longer a marionette, but that he had become a real live boy. He looked all about him, and instead of the usual walls of straw, he found himself in a beautifully furnished little room, the prettiest he had ever seen. 
In a twinkling he jumped down from his bed to look on the chair standing near. There he found a new suit, a new hat, and a pair of shoes. As soon as he was dressed, he put his hands in his pockets, and pulled out a little leather purse on which were written the following words. The fairy with azure hair returns fifty pennies to her dear Pinocchio, with many thanks for his kind heart. The marionette opened the purse to find the money, and, behold, there were fifty gold coins! Pinocchio ran to the mirror. He hardly recognized himself. The bright face of a tall boy looked at him with wide-awake blue eyes, dark brown hair, and happy, smiling lips. Surrounded by so much splendor, the marionette hardly knew what he was doing. He rubbed his eyes two or three times, wondering if he were still asleep or awake, and decided he must be awake. "'And where is father?' he cried suddenly. He ran into the next room, and there stood Geppetto, grown years younger overnight, spick and span in his new clothes, and gay as a lark in the morning. He was once more Mastro Geppetto, the woodcarver, hard at work on a lovely picture-frame, decorating it with flowers and leaves, and heads of animals. "'Father, father, what has happened? Tell me if you can!' cried Pinocchio, as he ran and jumped on his father's neck. "'This sudden change in our house is all your doing, my dear Pinocchio,' answered Geppetto. "'What have I to do with it?' "'Just this. When bad boys become good and kind, they have the power of making their homes gay and new with happiness. I wonder where the old Pinocchio of wood has hidden himself.' "'There he is,' answered Geppetto, and he pointed to a large marionette leaning against a chair, head turned to one side, arms hanging limp, and legs twisted under him. After a long, long look, Pinocchio said to himself with great content, "'How ridiculous I was as a marionette! And how happy I am, now that I have become a real boy!' 